Now this morning, I'm continuing a series entitled simply Centurion. As we've said, we're looking at the different centurions in the New Testament. This, of course, will be a series that only deals with the New Testament. As I've said, there was no centurions and no Roman Empire in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, they are prolific, and they appear in a lot of different places. This morning, I want to look at a centurion that is relevant to the life of Paul. Actually, the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at different centurions that um, interact with and are found in the life of Paul. But this morning, turn to Acts chapter 21, if you will. Let me give you a backstory on this before we read it so you understand what's happening. Paul has traveled around the entire Mediterranean Sea basin. He has gone from one city to the next, Corinth, Ephesus, Philippi. He's just traveled all around the Mediterranean Sea. And he is primarily, you guys remember this, he is primarily called to preach the gospel to Gentiles all of us. So he's called to preach the gospel to Gentiles. You remember when Christianity started, it was simply an offshoot of Judaism. But now the focus has shifted, and Paul is preaching more and more to Gentiles, and so he's becoming hanging out with Gentiles, non-Jewish people, uh, starting churches in Gentile neighborhoods, all these kinds of things, okay? So he has traveled and traveled and traveled, and he returns to Jerusalem. And as he's returned to Jerusalem, he decides to go and sanctify himself in the temple because Paul is a Jew. And so he goes to the temple to sanctify himself, to to spend a week there doing all the sanctification rituals that were necessary under Jewish law. What happens is he takes some other Jewish men with him. While they are in the temple together, they are falsely accused. Paul, more specifically, is falsely accused of bringing Gentiles into the temple, which is a, 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 which is a misdeed or an, a, an error that is punished by death. Okay, You cannot bring Gentile people, non-Jews, into certain areas of the temple. So they see Paul with people that they don't recognize, and because Paul hangs out with Gentiles, they jump to the conclusion that Paul has brought Gentiles into the temple, which is illegal under Jewish law. All right, so that's where we pick up. The Jewish people in the temple have freaked out because they're trying to kill Paul because they believe wrongly, wrongly, they believe wrongly that he has brought Gentiles into the temple. That's where we pick up in the story, okay? I just want you to have the backstory. So Acts 21 and 30. And all the city was disturbed. We just talked about why they were disturbed. And all the city was disturbed, and the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. Now as they were seeking to kill him, news came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains. And he asked, that is the commander asked, who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. So when the commander could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, he commanded Paul to be taken into the barracks. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the next few moments that you will speak to us. We want to hear from you this morning. Speak to us. Let your Holy Spirit move. Deep unto deep. Spirit unto spirit. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I have shared with you many, many, many times, and as is no surprise to any of the women in my life, including my uh, mom who is here. Actually, I actually have all three of the women in my life here this morning because my mother-in-law came up for Owen's graduation. So I have Courtney, my wife, and my mother-in-law, and Allison, my mom. All of them, my mom has known me the longest, but all of them have known me since high school because Courtney and I dated in high school. And all of them can attest to the fact that I did not always do what I was supposed to be doing, all right? And I have made that clear many, many times from this pulpit. One of the things that most of the adult figures and authority figures in my life would say to me on a very regular basis in high school and middle school was, did you hear me? Travis, did you hear me? I cannot tell you how many teachers have asked me that. And I would inevitably respond, yes, I did hear you. And they would say, then why aren't you doing what I told you? And I was like, because I don't want to. 
I mean, I don't know what to tell you, uh, right? Those of you who are teachers are thinking, I really don't like 15-year-old Pastor Travis. And I agree with you 100%. I'm not real proud of 15-year-old Pastor Travis either. So, but, but inevitably, my parents, the adults, the authority figures, did you hear me? Did you hear what I was saying? My issue was not that I didn't hear them. My issue was the response to what they were saying, Our middle son, Owen, who just graduated, he inherited, unfortunately, my same DNA uh, genetics in response to authority. Owen's primarily had to do with coaches and athletics. So Owen's a fantastic athlete, but Owen does not respond real well to uh, uh, coaches that scream and yell. So we'd be playing basketball, right? And the coach would say, Owen, run! And Owen wouldn't run, he would just pump his arms faster. It was the craziest thing I ever saw. So he was still moving at the same speed, but it it had the illusion that he was actually running faster. It was a fascinating thing. But that was, Owen, run, Owen, do this. And he, he, as I did, did not respond real well to screaming. It wasn't that he didn't hear the coach. It wasn't that I didn't hear my teachers. It was the idea of the response to what they were saying. That's actually what I want to look at this morning. It is not, this is not a sermon on how to hear from God necessarily. This is a sermon on our response to God talking. What do we do in response to God speaking to us? And I want to stay in this story from Acts. So what happens is the commander takes Paul back to the barracks. We're not going to read this. And the commander says, what is going on? And Paul says, hey, this is not a problem. Just let me talk to the people and everything will be fine. I'll clear it all up. Everything will be fine if you'll just let me talk to the people. We're not going to read it. So in the beginning of Acts chapter 22, Paul begins to share his testimony. So the commander says, okay, if you can calm the crowd down, then we'll do it. So they take him back out of the barracks. The crowd has assembled there in front of this Roman barracks. The, The commander puts Paul on the steps. The crowd is down below, just like this, standing, listening, and Paul begins to share his testimony. He talks about how he was struck blind. He talks about how Ananias prayed for him. He just shares his testimony. We're going to pick up with the very end of the testimony. Look at Acts 22 and 17. Paul is still speaking, Acts 22 and 17, and he says, Now it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I was in a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believe on you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by, consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he, God, he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And the crowd listened to him until this word. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be brought back into the barracks and said said that he should be examined under scourging or beating that he should be beaten or whipped so that he might know why they had shouted so against him. It's a fascinating little verse, isn't it? Paul tells his testimony. Everybody listens. Everybody's calm. Everybody is mature. Nothing bad's happening. Paul tells his testimony, hey, I did this. Hey, I did that. Everybody politely listens. He goes through, and he says the word Gentiles. He says the word Gentiles. We read it. And they listened to him until this word. He says the word Gentiles, and they freak out and start tearing their clothes and kill him, kill him, kill him, and throwing dust in the air. And the commander has to pull him back into the barracks. And I'm sure the commander, when he got him back inside, was like, nice job, dude. You said you were going to calm him down, you know? (laughs) And so he pulls him back into the barracks. So what happened? What What was their response? The crowd refused. The crowd refused. They were willing to listen until Paul said something they didn't like. How many of us do the same thing? 
God says, Travis, I want to bless you. And you say, I received that. Travis, I want to open doors of opportunity. I received that. Travis, I want you to forgive that person. Ooh, right? We do the same thing. We're more than willing to let God speak into our lives until he speaks something into our lives that we don't like, that we disagree with, that we don't want to do. And then we freak out just like the crowd did with Paul. We refuse to continue to listen. We're willing to listen until something bothers us, until something happens that we don't like. So we say, hey, God is God. Whatever you say, I'm fine with. God is God. And God is God until what? Until he interferes with what we want to do. Until he interferes with our desires and our wants. Until he says to us, I need you to do this. I want you to go there. I want you to do this. And then all of a sudden, we become like the crowd. We're willing to listen as long as we're willing to listen. As long as God says nothing that interferes with our preconceived notions. My wife, Courtney, uh, and I have been married for a long time now. At the end of this month, we've been married 22 years. So over 22 years, there is one thing that she absolutely hates that I do. I tell you, probably the number one thing. Courtney hates to watch television with me. So usually, I watch TV, and she sits on the couch and is on her phone or her iPad or something like that. Most of the men in here have been married for a long time. You know exactly what I'm going to say, right? Because what? I don't want to watch the commercials. So we watch something, and then when the commercials come on, I flip. And she's like, "How can you're going so fast. How can you even tell what it is? Right? She always yells at me, how do you even know what we're... Oh, have you ever... Well, you haven't sat with her. Maybe your wife. Have you ever had your wife change the channels on a TV? And I'm like, right. and she's like, well, I don't know if I want to watch it or not. And I'm like, in like a second, you can tell whether you want to watch it or not. And it's this excruciating, and then you just, I'm like, did she fall asleep? What are we doing? You know, because I'm like this, I can go all the way around, you know, and just, right? So what happens? Inevitably, we watch something. She gets emotionally invested in it. We're watching it. The commercials come on. I flip over to the Braves game. We watch that. And what happens? I forget what we were even watching the other thing. And then I can't remember what channel it was on. And we get back to it. And she's like, oh, you idiot. We missed half of it. Now I don't know which cabin they bought, right? Or which beach house they bought. All we do, all we do is watch television programs about other people buying houses. I don't know what happens. That's it. Only thing we watch in my house is sports and people buying houses. Other people buying houses that we don't know. Houses at the cabin, houses at the beach, beach hunters, international house hunters, people buying houses in Prague, people buying. It's, 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 it's unending the number of houses that we watch other people buy and then ridicule their choices inevitably. You know you do. Oh, uh, they're idiots. They should have chose house number two. They're morons, right? So, but all of that to say, all of that to say, what, that, that, that control over all of the, so much of our life, anything that we don't like, we, it's gone. Video's gone, our phone, our iPad, the TV. So we've created this consumer mentality that has now bled over into our spiritual life. So the second that God says something we don't like, what do we do? We grab the spiritual remote control and we mute it or we change the channel. And they listen to him until this word. Everybody was fine until Paul said something that challenged their preconceived beliefs and then they immediately tuned him out. How much, how often do we do the same thing with God? Don't allow that approach to your spiritual life. You like I said, this is not about how to hear from God. My feeling is that most of us hear from God more regularly than we would like to admit. What most of us do is change the channel because we say to ourselves, that's not from God. God doesn't want me to forgive that person. God doesn't want me to do that. God doesn't want me to stretch myself. God doesn't want me to do anything uncomfortable. God doesn't want to take me outside of my box. God doesn't want to change my preconceived notions. God doesn't want to do anything that's outside of what I want to do. I think God speaks to us much more regularly than we'd like to admit. We simply don't want to listen. So the crowd refused to hear. The crowd refused to hear. Now, go back to Acts. 
we're going to skip forward and come back to it. But after this encounter with the crowd, the centurions don't know what to do with Paul. They're bamboozled, basically, by him because he hasn't, he hasn't broken any Roman law. This is some kind of internal deal with the other Jewish people. The Roman centurions don't understand it. So they decide, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll take Paul to the Jewish ruling council, which is the Sanhedrin. So we say, okay, we're going to take Paul to appear before the Sanhedrin. This is made up of both Pharisees and Sadducees. So he takes them to this ruling religious council. So these are the most religious guys in the entire nation. The high priest is there, the scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, these are the guys. So the Romans say to themselves, and it makes sense, the Romans say this is a Jewish law. We don't understand what they're mad about. We don't get it. We'll just take him and let these guys decide. So they take him to the Sanhedrin. Look at Rome, uh, sorry, Acts 23 and 1. Just the next chapter over. Acts 23 and 1. Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. I want to stop right there. That is all he says. Go back to verse 1 for me for just a second. Leave that up. Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. This is how the most religious guys in the nation respond. Verse 2, and the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by Paul to strike him in the mouth. What? Now, I want you to imagine this. You're a guest here at Restoration Church, and you come up to me after the service. You say, Pastor Travis, this is our first time here. I'm so glad to be here. I say, it's nice to meet you, too. And they said, well, I just wanted to share something with you. I have lived before God in good conscience until this very day. And imagine if I said, Rico. <laughs> right? <laughs> and Rico comes up, mm. I say, now get out. Right? Imagine that. He says, I have lived before God in good conscience until this day. And the high priest says, punch that guy in the mouth. Punch that guy right in the face. It's an amazing response to a very, very innocuous statement. He doesn't say anything crazy. He does not say the word Gentile, I'd like to point out. He just says, I live before God in good conscience. And Ananias, the high priest, is trying to take him out. Now skip down. So what happens? Look at verse 6. But when Paul perceived that one part of the council were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say, say that there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Then there arose a loud outcry, and the, and the scribes of the Pharisees' party arose and protested, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul might be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him back into the barracks." All right, so let me explain to you what's happening here. The council is made up of two different types of believer, uh, Jewish rulers, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. As it's said here, and you may not have understood it, the Pharisees believe in the supernatural. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection. They believed in angels. They believed in the Holy Spirit. They believed in all of these things. The Sadducees did not believe in any of this stuff. That's why they were sad, you see. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, they're, they're not all winners. I have to do this twice a week. They're not all winners, okay? But, okay, so sad, you see, all right? So they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe in angels. They don't believe in the Holy Spirit. So Paul, realizing that these guys already are mad at each other, says, hey, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, and I can't wait until the resurrection. And what do they do? They just, they just begin to fight each other. It gets so bad, it says, the commander of the centurions thought they were going to literally pull part Paul apart. No longer willing to simply punch him in the mouth, now they're trying to pull him limb from limb. Remember, these are the most religious people in the nation. And the Roman centurion is worried that they're literally going to pull a guy's arms and legs off. Why? Because the religious argue 
when they hear from God. The super religious want to argue. God speaks and the super religious, the hyper religious say, well, that doesn't, that doesn't match my theology, God. That doesn't match my dogma. That doesn't match what I believe. And what happens is instead of hearing what God says to us, what we, wanted, what we end up doing is fighting with each other about who is right. God says, I have called you to change the world. God says to all of us, I've called you to tell people about my love for them. I have called you to love others as I have loved you, so you should love others. I've called you to do all that. And what do we do? We end up with just religious civil war where we're all fighting about tiny little minuscule in, insignificant stuff. And we are missing the greater call and we are missing what God is saying to us. So God is speaking and we would rather argue with each other and argue with him than do what he says. The crowd refused to listen. The religious argued among themselves, mad at each other. Paul was in the, was in the midst of them talking about Jesus. And instead of listening to him, they would prefer to spew bile and hatred at each other and attack each other. I don't know how many of you that sounds convicting to, but that is somewhat convicting to me. We cannot, we must not become a community of faith that is only defined by the stuff that we're against and the things that we hate. We must become a community of faith that is about love and mercy and forgiveness. That is what God is saying to us, but as long as we're mad at everybody else and mad at each other, Look at all the anger in this room. Look at all the anger in this room. Paul says one sentence, and the high priest wants to punch him in the mouth. Paul says another sentence, and they all fight each other. And eventually, the centurions have to take Paul out in order to rescue and save his life from being pulled limb from limb by the high priest and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The, very, the, the most religious people have the highest level of anger. It's a fascinating thing. The level of rage in these verses exhibited in this room. That cannot be us. That must not be us. The religious must be the most willing to hear what God is saying to them and be willing to step out in faith. Not being angry with God and angry with everybody else and fighting and arguing. That's not what we should do when we hear God. So what does it look like? As we said last week, for those who weren't here, we talked about the idea that the, one of the best examples of biblically balanced healing is found in the centurion that comes to Jesus and asks for healing. We talked about that last week. Let me also say one of the best and most biblically sound responses to hearing God's voice, also by a Roman centurion of all crazy things. Look at Acts 22 and 25. We're going back in the story. This happens between the crowd and the Sanhedrin. So the crowd tries to kill Paul. They take him back into the barracks. Before they take him to the Sanhedrin, what we just read, this little story happens. They bring him back into the barracks, and we just said it. The commander had decided that Paul should be whipped or beaten in order to figure out what was happening. Okay? Verse 25, Acts 22 and 25. And as they bound him with thongs or with, you know, handcuffs, basically. As they tied up his hands, as they tied him as they tied his hands, as they bound him, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the commander, saying, take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, to Paul, tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, yes. The commander answered, with a large sum, I also obtained this citizenship. And Paul said, I was born a citizen. I was born a citizen. So they're about to beat Paul. And Paul, imagine this scene. They're tying his hands up. And Paul just very casually turns to the centurion next to him. And he says, you know, remind me. I, I can't remember. 
is it, uh, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen? He doesn't say he's a Roman citizen. He just says, uh, you know, you're a centurion. You know the law a lot better than I do. I just remind me, can you guys beat an uncondemned Roman citizen? And the centurion hears it and listens and goes and talks to his commander. It's a fascinating thing. So the crowd refuses. The religious argue. But here's what we're supposed to do when we hear God. The centurion listens. He just listens. That's all he did. That's all he does. That's all we're called to do. As we hear God speak, we listen. Instead of fighting, instead of arguing, instead of getting all mad about it, just listen. How many times does somebody that's about to be beaten say to the centurion, hey, I'm a Roman citizen? I would think a lot. You've got to remember, this is like thousands of years ago. How exactly would you prove Roman citizenship? You don't pull out your ID card. You don't pull out your, you know, proof of insurance. You don't pull out your, you know what I'm saying? How would you prove being a Roman citizen? I bet he hears it all the time. But the centurion was willing to listen. There was something about Paul. There was something about the way Paul was talking. There was something about the way Paul was speaking that made him listen. My feeling is all of us hear God all the time. Or not maybe all the time, but a lot of the time. Or maybe not a lot of the time, but at least some of the time. The issue is what do you do after the hearing? It is the same as what my teachers used to say to me. Travis, didn't you hear me? Yeah, I did. I just chose to ignore it. And so then we come in here and say, oh, I just wish God would speak to me. My feeling is God speaks to all of us more than we would like to admit. And we, like 15-year-old Travis used to do, simply ignore what he says. The centurion listened. It wasn't complicated. It wasn't, this is not some extravagant thing that he did. He's simply willing to listen to what is being said. It requires, it requires focus. And it requires some levels of solitude. A number of years ago, it's only happened to me once, but a number of years ago over Christmas break, uh, when I was pastoring a church elsewhere, we actually drove down to Florida to visit with my in-laws for Christmas. And on the trip down there, I lost my voice. I'm not talking about a little bit. I'm talking about I completely lost my voice. I have no idea why it happened. I couldn't figure anything else that had happened. I don't know what happened. But when I say it was gone, I mean gone. It's the only time I've ever had that laryngitis type thing. And it wasn't a little, I mean, it was gone. It was gone. That was it. Courtney was like the happiest she's ever been, right? <laughs> She was like, it's a Christmas miracle. <laughs> so, so, but it was gone, okay? So I learned I couldn't scream at my kids anymore. I couldn't, Mark, Owen. I was like, Mark, Owen. And my older ones are like, what? I didn't know. <laughs> right? And so Liam, Liam's 11 now. This was years ago. He was probably just five or six. He, he was such a little guy. If I stood up, he couldn't hear me talk to him way down there. So whenever I talked to Liam, I had to get down on my knees and talk to him right like this. So one day, a couple of days after Christmas, we all went to the mall together, and then we broke up into different groups, and some of us went to see movies, some of us, and I ended up just me and Liam. And Liam wanted Chick-fil-A. So we went to the Chick-fil-A in the mall, in the food court. And I got up to the counter, and I was like, I want a nugget. And the girl was like, what? <laughs> right? And so I said, like this. And, she le and I leaned over the counter. I know she thought I was like super creepy old guy, right? <laughs> so I like leaned over the counter and I had to whisper, I had to whisper my order. I had to whisper my order into her ear. Okay, I'm just going to be honest with you. Most of the time you are not getting an angel with a flaming sword. If you don't spend time alone with God in the attitude of being willing to listen to anything he says to you, then you are probably going to complain about not hearing from God more than you should. 
Get alone with God. Don't refuse to listen to anything. Don't argue. Just get alone and let the word of God wash over you. Hear what he says, but don't just hear. Listen. Listen to it and obey. The more we refuse when he speaks to us, the easier and easier it is to continue to refuse. And I'm going to be honest with you, I firmly believe that the fainter and fainter God's voice gets. The more and more you tell God no, I think the easier it is to dismiss God the longer you go. So, I want to show you a video to close. As I said earlier, we were working on this till the very end. I want to show you a video as we close. I want you to see this. It's a, it's a fascinating and really emotional and inspirational little video. It's about people who have been born deaf that are being fitted with an um, implant for the first time ever so that they can hear. I want you to see the responses of these people, men, women, kids, adults. I want you to see the response of them in their first moments of actually being able to hear others and being able to hear themselves. Take a look at this. That, listen to me, that is what it's supposed to look like. That's what it's supposed to look like. They are simply hearing the words of their loved ones and their own voices for the first time. When you hear the word of your heavenly Father calling your name, that's what it's supposed to look like. When he says something that is challenging to us, we're not supposed to rip our clothes and run away and argue. We're not supposed to refuse to listen. We're not supposed to argue with each other. Assured, confident in our own dogma and theology and willing to destroy anyone who thinks differently than we do. The voice of God changes everything. The word of the Lord to you, for you, changes everything. What did the one girl say? It's so different. It's so different. The word of the Lord, if you like the centurion will really 
honestly, genuinely listen, it changes everything. It changes everything. It not only changes your relationship with God, it changes who you are. Did you see how many of them became emotional? Not about hearing other people's voices, but about what? Hearing their own voice, right? When you hear the word of God, it changes who you are. When they could hear, it transformed them because they could finally hear themselves. When you allow the word of the Lord to enter, when you really listen to it, it transforms who you are. It makes you a whole different person. It changes you. The word of God, if we will simply listen, if we will simply listen, not argue, not refuse, just listen like the centurion did. The word of God for your life changes everything. It will change everything. That, that video is how we should respond when God moves in our life. Because it changes everything. God is speaking to all of us, to each of us. God is speaking to you. I encourage you to simply step back. Don't argue. Don't refuse. Just step back and be willing to listen. No matter what he says. Just listen. Let's pray. God, I thank you for every person, every life and family represented here this morning on Mother's Day. God, I ask, as we close this service, I intercede for every person here that they would begin to hear you. You may have spoken to them in the past and they've been unwilling to, to listen about that one thing. Right now, that may be some of you. You don't have to raise your hand. We're not going to call you up to the front. But you may say, God has been speaking to me about something and I have refused, like the crowd did with Paul, I have refused to give it to him. Right now in your mind, in your spirit, I want you to visualize that thing and I want you to give it to God. Let him speak to you about anything. Others may say, I've been, I've been angry. I've been so mad. I've been fighting with everybody as the religious leaders did. I want love. I want to hear what God is saying to me and I want to show His love to others. No matter where you are in this moment, I encourage you as I close this service, He is speaking to you. He is speaking to all of us. Give, give Him complete access. Give God complete access to your life and be willing to listen to anything you, He says. If you are willing to listen to anything He says, I promise you, it will transform your life and everything will be so, so different. Listen to God and obey his word. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray.